All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, God gave us our daily bread through uh, all the people who worked and made the food and served it. And uh, we're grateful uh, to them and uh, to God for working through them. So we, we talked about vocation. Now we want to talk about uh, vocation and the Christian life. So I love this painting. It's another Rembrandt, Christ on the Sea of Galilee. And as you can see, the on the right side or the left side of the of the painting, it's chaos. And the disciples are in a storm, they're trying to work the sails and they're panicked. And but, but then as you the eye is led toward the bottom right around uh, Christ. And you see the, the serenity around Christ and those who are t turning to him, it's a very peaceful part of the ship. Those who are looking away from him are in a state of, of, of panic. Uh, it's a great picture, I think, of the Christian life. And the Christian life and vocation, you know, Christ, uh, okay, literally, he's in, he's in the same boat with us, okay? And uh, later we know Christ stills the storm. But this painting is just a great meditation on, on Christ in that tumultuous situation. By the way, this painting by Rembrandt uh, was stolen uh, a number of years ago, and it has not been found. Uh, if you're ever in a secondhand shop and you see this painting and they're selling it for uh, $10, <laughs> grab it. <clears throat> uh, I'll say something a little bit before we get into the, the heart of it. Vocation of Christians and the offices of non believers. Some I've made the point that the word calling and thus vocation probably should be reserved for Christians because we're the ones who've been called by the gospel and we know God's word calls us to these things. Um, so there are other words for non-Christians, uh, offices, stations, places in life. So it's a matter of terminology it's important to remember that God providentially works through both. I mean, whether the farmer who grew the grain that went into the pastry for our uh, sausage roll today was a Christian, I don't know. I'd like to hope so. Uh, but if not, God still used that person who grew the grain to give us our daily bread and not the nutrients that we need. So... It's important to remember that God works even through people who don't know him. Even those who are non-believers. And yet God is still very close to, to them also. Um, you can work in unbelief. You can do what you do just for the self. And when you work in unbelief, again... Your work and your relationships are, are empty of God, even though he's there, but you don't know him, aren't aware of him. And you work in faith, when you're conscious of the neighbor, what you do all of a sudden has a purpose that it didn't have before. And our work and our relationships give us glimpses of the, of the hidden God. Okay, well, th th this is the point. We live out our Christian faith primarily in our vocations. We have a relationship to God. I'm going to talk about the divine service and how God, how Christ comes to us, how we're brought to him in the gospel, and then God sends us out to the rest of the week into our daily, ordinary lives, back to our families, back to the workplace. And 
that's where we live it out. Uh, that's where we have problems and, and our faith can help us through those. But sometimes we still have the problems. That's where we have temptations. That's where we battle sin. But that's where the Christian life takes place. <coughs> Scripture talks about the fruit of faith. Faith working through love, St. Paul uses that phrase in Galatians. And again, our faith is to bear fruit in love. Now, it doesn't always. And, and, and doing that is part of the big challenge in vocation and in our Christian lives. We'll be talking about that. But vocation is also where things like evangelism happens. It's in our vocations that we interact with non-Christians. It's in our vocations that, we, that as Christians we take Christ who dwells with us into these other places. And not that we should use our vocations... Uh, I know some people say, well, the value of my work is I share the gospel all the time. To the point, maybe, of not doing their work or of annoying all their other workers. That's not the point. You, the, your calling is, has a certain work of that calling. You do a good job. Do the best you can at what you're being paid to do. That's how you're loving and serving your neighbors. But naturally, in the relationships you form... You usually get to be good friends with your co-workers. They tell you about their problems. Uh, be, as you know, conversations can, can rise very, very easily. Or you can talk about your faith. Invite them to church with you. Say, oh, you ought to talk to my pastor. Uh, but this is where Christians become salt and light in the world. Uh, a big part of evangelism happens in families where parents take their children to be baptized, where they take them to church, where they talk to them about, uh, about the Lord. And that's some of the most powerful evangelism that takes place. I've had students who say, well, am I really a Christian? You know, I just grew up with this. My parents taught it to me. How do I know it's really, it's really mine? How do, as if God working through their families isn't God reaching them. And as if what happens in the vocation of the family is not a, a spiritual thing. And so, anyway, most people come to faith uh, through their, their parents and through their early days and Again, who bring them to church and the like. Um, and evangelism is where we grow in our faith. We grow in sanctification. We're, we're, we're made stronger in our, in, in our faith, in our holiness. Vocation is where good works happen. When we love and serve the neighbors of our vocation, we are co-workers with God. And God is loving our neighbors, loving other people through us in our vocation. And so when we're loving them too and serving them, we're working with God. And sometimes we work against God and you know we sin in various ways. Sometimes God works through us despite ourselves. He's still doing good through, through us, even when we are not very really loving others as we should. But when it's all working together, our love of our neighbor is, is caught up in God's love for his creation. So that his love is expressed through our love his creation and our creativity, his creative power to make new things. We, we, we can take part in that when we make new things in uh, some of the things we do. But as we said, 
we also sin in vocation. So th this takes many different forms. Sometimes instead of loving and serving our neighbor, we harm our neighbor. Um, you know, people have asked, is anything we do to make a living a vocation? Well, not necessarily. I mean, if you make your living by burglary, no, that's not a vocation from God. God doesn't call you to do that. And again, you're not loving and serving your neighbor as you make your living. You are stealing your neighbor's stuff. You're breaking the commandments. You're, uh, but there are a lot of even legal um, ways people make money, people make a living that are not calling from God. Um, being a pornographer, for example, is, is legal. But again, you're making your living by causing other people to sin. Does God call you to do that? No. No. And so I know there are some things that opinions may vary, on, vary about. You can discuss it. I, I gave a talk on vocation to a group of pastors in... Uh, uh, at Las Vegas, and uh, we were talking about that, and I had to t talk about well, what a lot of, some of my, members of my uh, of our congregation are, you know, blackjack dealers, and uh, so I uh, I said it's not my vocation to uh, uh, rule on those kinds of things, but uh, I, I think some of these things can be innocent ways of entertainment, but they can also be ways of harming your neighbor. Uh, and some people need to, to think through that. Um, related to that is sins against vocation. For example, one way of harming your neighbor, when it's, say you have a vocation of being a parent, but you abuse your children. Instead of loving and serving them, you are harming them. But it's even more perverted because they're your kids. Your vocation is to love and serve and care for your children. But when instead of doing that, you harm them, I mean, that's, just, that's sinful on so many different levels. But among other things, it's a sin against your vocation. God called you uh, to love and serve a particular neighbor, and instead you violate that. Um, you know, in marriage, husbands who abuse their, their wives, or uh, frankly, doctors who become abortionists. You know, they're, they're called to bring healing, to, 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 to love and serve people by bringing them healing, not by killing them. You know, Victoria's going to be voting on uh, euthanasia law where doctors will, will legally um, kill their patients. Again, that's a violation of the commandment against murder. On another level, it's, it's a sin against the vocation of, of healing that physicians and other are, are called to. Or sinning against vocation when, when you're called to be a leader in your in your country, say you're a politician or you're a government official, and when you use that office to exploit the people under your authority, um, I have that. I guess back again. That's a sin against your vocation. That's not why God called you to that office. Rather, it is to, to love and serve them. Uh, we can act outside of our vocation when we take upon ourselves something that really we don't have the, the authority to do. We don't have the vocation to do. Um, if somebody breaks into your car and steals your uh, uh, stereo, 
you don't have to go get a gun and track them down and you know shoot them in the streets. You call the police. You know they have a calling to deal with things like that in a way that an ordinary citizen does not. And there are other cases. Uh, um, again. Parents are in charge of their of their children, and sometimes I feel that some of the government officials uh, interfere with that in a way that they don't really have the calling, to, uh, the authority to uh, uh, to tell parents exactly how they have to to raise their kids, and there are other things. Usually, it comes down though to this: a lot of the problems we have in our vocations, wanting to be served rather than to serve. Going to be served rather than to serve. Um, so many marriages are broken up really over this. Uh, both the husband and the wife, they want to be served, you know, uh, you know, my wife, wife, you need to do this, this, and this, and this for me. And the wife says, you need to do this, this, and this for me. And both want to be served, but the other side of the coin, neither is, is serving the other, as, as, as vocation would, uh, would, would, would require. Um... I'll say some more things about this, but in in a relationship like that, in God's design, both the husband and the wife, when they're serving each other, both are served. They are served, and they have their needs met, but they're meeting the other person's need, and, and it's easier to serve when you're being served, and that dynamic give and take giving and receiving relationship is really the key i think to uh to good marriages it's a key to strong families it's the key even to th things in the workplace um so many people you know the boss wants everybody to serve him but when they don't feel served by the boss it's hard to work hard for someone like that but this pattern again needs to uh, unfold in vocation, but that that ego, that, that that desire to just take, 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 and take, and not give, that's an occasion to for sin. We'll say some more things about this later. Um, also, in vocation is the phenomenon of. Bearing the cross. Bearing the cross. This happens in vocation. Um, Luke 9, uh, Jesus said uh, to them all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. First of all, notice... Let him deny himself. The, the ethic of everything we hear about today, if you read a book about marriage, if you read a book about child raising, even a lot of Christian books, they're all about self-fulfillment. How to find fulfillment in your marriage. How to find fulfillment with your children. How to find fulfillment on the job. Everything is about self-fulfillment. Whereas the scripture talks about self-denial. That's pretty opposite, much of what you'll, you'll see. And yet, um, let's read the rest of it. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. Okay, now there are crosses that we bear, the real terrible problems and the trials and difficulties. Okay, those are crosses. But here he's talking about things that happen every day as crosses. There are daily crosses. And 
that daily, I think, underscores the fact that these crosses are going to happen in vocation, where we live daily. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, these are, I think a lot of the crosses we have in our vocation, they're very small. Sometimes they're very big. But it seems to me that every time you love and serve your neighbor, that entails an act of self-denial. You're denying yourself out of love for your neighbor. Uh, the... I mean, on on the job, you know, the, the alarm rings, you have to get up. Maybe you don't really want to go to work that day, but you do anyway because you have to make a living for your family. You know, you're loving them through what you do. You maybe have responsibility to your customers. They need what you're going to do or your coworkers. You know, if you don't, help the team they're all going to suffer and so you deny yourself get up out of bed go to work even though you'd rather not and in a way i think every act of loving and serving your neighbor involves a little sacrifice of yourself for someone else and, and maybe very but notice that's, those aren't always bad things or even unself-fulfilling uh, things. Uh, let's finish this text. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Okay, the Greek word there is sukane, which is the same word for psyche. Psychology comes from that. It means kind of, all right, life, but also kind of the mind and kind of the self in some context. So the pattern is if you try to, let me really paraphrase that. If you try to fulfill yourself and that's your priority in everything in your life, you're not going to fulfill yourself. You're going to lose yourself in a bad way. But if you lose your life for the sake of others, if you sacrifice yourself for others, you're going to get yourself taken care of. You're going to find yourself. You'll save yourself. Have you experienced where that's, where that's true? Um, Anyway, I think that's I think we, we see things like that in various other places in Scripture. But again, the cross, yes, it's a, it's an instrument of suffering, an instrument of of torment, but it's also an instrument of of sacrifice. Okay, like I said, loving and serving the neighbor is a type of sacrificing oneself for one's neighbor. Uh, to be sure, we don't have to make sacrifices for our sin. We don't have to sacrifice before God. Our relationship uh, with him is based solely on Christ's sacrifice once and for all, this says in the book of Hebrews. But then scripture talks about other kinds of sacrifices. Um, St. Paul talks about present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And so sometimes I think that the person who comes home from late from work, bone tired, because he's just, he just given everything you had, that's a kind of a living sacrifice. You present your body as a living sacrifice uh, for, for others. But again, there's a promise. Uh, there's a reward. You know, it, it's important as Christians to keep in mind this distinction, self-denial versus self-fulfillment. And vocation is not about self-fulfillment. Um, I got in a little controversy over the Internet. Uh, some really distinguished uh, theologian wrote a post called... Uh, 
the danger of Luther's doctrine on vocation. And he said that, uh, you know, Luther's doctrine can encourage people to just stay down at low vocations instead of, you know, finding their fulfillment in others. And he talked about, so I was on a, when I was in a university, I worked in a canning factory just to put my way, pay my way through school. And it was so boring and tedious and it didn't use my talents at all. And there was a woman there that had been working in that factory for, for 20 years. And I just felt so sorry for her. He said, that was just a job. That was just a way to earn some money. Later, when I graduated and became a, a professor and a theologian, now I find fulfillment. That is my true calling. And again, he learned you know, nothing about that, uh, about what vocation really is. That woman, even in if it's hard and tedious work, God is working through her to 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 feed thousands. But the dignity of ordinary labor, if you understand vocation, you can't say that any kind of work is unworthy. Now, he was measuring the value of the work by how fulfilling he found it. Well, some vocations are fulfilling, others aren't. Now, vocations change when he was working in that factory. That was his calling, one of his callings, right then and there. And that woman that he was looking his, down his nose at was his neighbor whom he used to love and serve, which I don't think he was doing or even cared about. He was busy putting himself up at her expense. Now, at that time, that was where he, God assigned him to love and serve. Now, later, vocation isn't forever, Later, he graduated from his program. Later, he got a job as a professor. Okay, and then that's his calling, for he used to love and serve his neighbors. And, you know, there may be other callings along the way. You know, that woman might, you know, have another vocation too. But vocations are in the here and now. You know, a lot of my students were always thinking about what they were going to do in the future what job they were going to have, what profession they were going to enter. He said, right now, your vocation is to be a student. And your two, the proper work of this being a student is to study, for one thing. And you have neighbors here around you. Love and serve them. If you're working in a, in a menial job somewhere, uh, that's... That's a vocation. Honor that and, and, and learn from it. And God may call you to different things, but um, the measure is not about self. Again, it's, it's the neighbor. You don't always think about yourself. If you do, you're going to be miserable, and you're not even going to be fulfilled, even though that's what you're trying to, to get. Look at your neighbor in your different callings. And look at our growth, not just your desires. <clears throat> because I want to show you um, the struggles we have in our vocation become ways that we can grow <clears throat> uh, spiritually. Now, I, I want to just pause a minute to look at one specific vocation and what scripture uh, teaches about it and to show you how what we've said about vocation is biblical uh, and how it's very uh, profound. Okay, I want to look at some passages from Ephesians 5. Okay, this is a very unpopular text today, as you can imagine. 
wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. And as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Oh, again, this idea of submission, oh, so unpopular, so negative, so anti-feminist, so um, uh, you name it. But, okay, this is what, I'll come back to that. This is what God's word says to wives. Okay, the next verse, see what God's word says to husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. It's a beautiful description of baptism. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor. Okay, so wives are told to submit to their husbands. Now that, to submit to someone means sacrificing yourself for them doesn't it? It's an act of self-denial. Now, husbands, to love your wives as Christ loved the church. So how did Christ love the church? Gave himself up for her. So husbands are also called to an act of sacrifice for their wives giving himself up for their wives as Christ gave himself up for the church. Now, both submission and giving himself up for giving himself up. These are acts of self-denial, right? Out of love for the other person, out of love for the neighbor in the vocation. Uh, now we also see that, Christ here is hidden in marriage. What about God being hidden in vocation? Marriage is an image of Christ and the church. Now again, you know, some women say, oh, he gets to be Jesus. That's not fair. Uh, well, but notice the... The, the, the husbands are told to emulate a certain thing about Jesus. How did he love the church? Giving himself up. Crucifixion. The cross. Yeah, the images of not of the husband sitting back in the chair, watching the television, yelling for his wife, bring me more beer. Uh, I mean, it, demanding, lording it over. Is that how Christ treats us? Is that how Christ treats the church? No. And, and that, but Christ and the church are in, in marriage. And what you see here is kind of a remarkable passage. And again, notice how it illustrates what I was saying about self-denial rather than self-affirming. Again, when Either husbands just want to be served and not serve, the marriage is going to be in trouble. When the wife wants to be served and not serve, marriage is in trouble. Um, the secret to building marriage by God's design is to understand vocation and what it means to deny oneself for others. Because this is not just in marriage. Immediately before the discussion of marriage, St. Paul says this, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so submission is, is the model for how Christians should relate to each other. That is by denying self out of love for 
your neighbors. Okay. Uh, Ephesians 6 goes on to deal with other vocations. You see similar things with children and parents. Notice he talks, he addresses both sides of the relationship. Children, fathers, children, obey your parents. That's an act of self-denial. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger. Um, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's what parenting involves. And God, you know, is a, uh, involved in, in that. The servants and masters. Uh, some of the translations are very literal, you know, slaves and masters. Uh, I, I, I think... Slavery in the ancient world was different than what we've known in the modern world, but um, the translation, we don't have slavery. Well, there is slavery in the world, we know that. But uh, in the economic system of the time, I like the translations uh, that, that make it applicable. So worker and boss, um, you know, wage slaves, as well as the... Uh, the, the people that pay your salary. And again, it addresses both, asking both sides to, to love and serve each other. Now, you could say, but there's authority in vocation. Aren't the, isn't the husband the authority in the marriage? Isn't the father the authority in parenting? Isn't the boss the authority? Yeah. But notice what Jesus says about authority. And Jesus called them to him and said to him, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Okay, this is how the Gentile, the non Christians, non believers are. You know, if you have authority, then that means you lord it over the people under your authority. He says, it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Again, the purpose of your vocation is servant, serving your neighbor. And so if you have authority, you need to use your authority in service to those under your under your care, really. And, and, and look how it builds up from that. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. So the kings and the people at top of that are slaves. The king has authority, but he has to act like a slave to his people. And get this. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Son of Man, the one who really does have authority, he really does deserve to be served. He came not to be served, but to serve, to serve us. Serve us sinners to give his life, give himself up, to give his life as a ransom for many. And so the point is, yes, there are issues of authority in different ways, different roles and, uh, and, and all of that. But again, all of those need to always be related back to serving the neighbor. Well, invocation as we grow in our faith and holiness. This is where we battle sin. Uh, someone said that every vocation has its certain besetting sins. Certain sins that keep coming up. Do you keep having to deal with? That you might be tempted and you might succumb to it. But... You may overcome it, but it keeps coming back. 
Okay, we're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, tomorrow, I think. But you might be looking at your own vocations and, and what, what are the issues that you keep having to deal with in your, in your different callings. Um, the confessions talk a lot about uh, mortification, putting to death, putting to death the flesh, our fleshly nature, our sinful nature, and putting on Christ. Uh, and I think this happens in vocation, uh, putting to death part of us, part of the, the fleshly desires or would want to take us in one level and wrestling with that. And again, it's the gospel as we put on Christ to, to encounter that. And it's in particular a realm of repentance and forgiveness. I think we see that very powerfully in the family and in marriage and in parenting where parents, we, we had this at the last, uh, in Hamilton, somebody spoke to us about parenting with law and gospel. You know, it isn't just enough when the child misbehaves to just punish the child. Take the opportunity to bring Christ into the picture. Yes, he's to bring the child to repentance and also to then to assure the child of the forgiveness of Christ and the forgiveness of the of the parents. That the family should be a place of repentance and forgiveness. And that's something that in every vocation it's going to be important. And this brings us really to the role of the divine service in our Christian life. Um, there, there's a section in the catechism about confessing our sins. And it's like, okay, before we go to church, to the pastor and confess our sins, what sin should we confess? It says, consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. You can place in life. There are other translations, uh, but some say station. It's really talking about vocation. Consider your different vocations according to the Ten Commandments. Uh, again, as we heard, the Ten Commandments are, are the measure of what we, how, how we're doing, um, how we love our neighbor. We look at the Ten Commandments, see what God requires of us in these different situations. But when you're preparing for confession, consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker? Just sums up uh, the different different callings. Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude, or quarrelsome? Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen? been negligent, wasted anything, or done any harm? Okay, so we seem to prepare for, for confession. And to me, I the confession absolution at the beginning of every service, uh, you know, to take a little bit of time, okay, well, how, how did I done? Okay, in my vocation as a, as a husband. Ten Commandments. And then as a, as a, as a, as a parent or then as a worker and you you measure yourself against those and you'll see that or I see that yeah I, I've transgressed a lot in my different callings but then catechism says I believe that when the called ministers of Christ called and ordained, the called ministers of Christ, deal with us by his divine command. 
particularly when they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better. This is just as valid and certain, even in heaven, as if Christ, our dear Lord, dealt with us himself. Wow. So when we pray, when we do the confession at the beginning of the service, again, you know, I'm a sinner. Uh, Think of the sins of, of vocation, and we bring those to God. Then we hear the pastor as a called servant of the word when he forgives us. That's just as certain as if Jesus Christ were there standing in front of us telling us we're forgiven. Because it is Jesus Christ telling us that. But he works through human beings, as we said. That's what the calling means. That's what the pastor's calling entails. And that's what we what we do um, in let me skip a slide. Yeah, we grow in faith when we have to use our faith. I'm going to go back to that. But notice the pattern of the Christian life. In our everyday lives, we are carrying out our vocation, but we sin in our vocation. We don't love and serve our neighbors as we should. And so we bring that to the divine service in worship. And in worship, we're absolved of those sins in our vocation, and we're built up in our faith by the law and gospel, by the preaching, hearing God's word, we are fed with the body and blood of Christ. Uh, again, John Klein points out there's, there's the, the holy thing, and that the, the, the holy things of the words that make us holy. And we receive them. And so we're built up in our faith. And then at the end, uh, there's the prayer that talks about. Uh, uh, in faithful love to you and in fervent love toward one another. Okay, we're sent back into our vocations for the, for, the, for the rest of the week. And here we work. We're sent back into our families, our marriages. And again, we, our faith is exercised in, uh, in love. But again, we probably sin some more next Sunday. We have things to confess. We're absolved, we're built up in our faith, built up in our holiness, and we're sent back. But just that pattern, vocation, the divine service, vocation, divine service, that's the pattern. And in that pattern, that's where we, we grow as Christians. Now, there also, there's sin, but there's also trials in our callings. And a lot of these trials, we just have to endure. The problems in your marriage, problems with our kids, maybe a, 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 a sickness or, you know, our company fails. There's not always going to be an easy answer for that. Uh, some things we, we, we have to endure. And, um, someone said that there are besetting trials in each vocation. When I think about what those are, in, the, in your marriage, there are certain difficulties, right? And it's not that one side is sinning or necessary or that you're sinning. It's just a hard thing to deal with. Or in parenting, certainly or on the job, or as citizens, or as in the church. They're just tough things to, uh, to, to, to handle. And it isn't that they can be necessarily solved. You just have to endure it. But trials drive us to prayer. You're facing these difficulties. What that does is make us pray. Luther talks about you know, d desperate prayers. 
and 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 God um, loves to loves for our, our our desperate prayer when we turn to Him because we can't do anything else. Trials also drive us to the Word of God, for we look for His promises, His encouragement, and when you're in a big difficulty in the midst of a trial. You know, you're, you're not just reading the Bible to find interesting points. It's, it's a desperate thing, and you find something encouraging, and you cling to it, right? And we increase our dependence on God. And that's good for us. And that's how we grow when these things happen. Now, another name for the doctrine of vocation is the priesthood of all believers. Maybe that phrase is a little more common than the, or familiar than the doctrine of vocation. But basically, it comes to the same thing. This does not mean that all believers are pastors. That's how some Christians take it. It means we don't have to be all pastors. It certainly doesn't mean that we don't need pastors. It means that you don't have to be a pastor to be a priest. Um, now, in fact, Protestant clergy, unlike Catholics, well, you have to make an exception for the Anglicans, usually aren't called priests. The reason in, in Catholicism, the belief is that the minister is sacrificing Christ again in the Mass. But Christ sacrifices once and for all. So Protestants tend to use other words for their, their ministers. As we said, there are new kinds of sacrifices. So what is a priest? Someone with access to what is holy. And again, now all Christians have God's word have access to God's word, have access to the, the communion wine as well as to the bread, which was not the case in, the, in Luther's day under the, the, old, the old order. And we can pr come before God and pr um, we all have access to the throne of God in our prayers. The priest is also um, an intercessor. Again, we carry out our priesthood in our callings. And so I was talking to Dr. Kleinig about this. He really emphasized this. And I was glad to see it actually is in my, uh, in my notes and presentation here. But he really stressed how important that is. That one of the best things we can do in our callings is to pray for the neighbors that we encounter. And so in marriage, to pray for your spouse, in parents, to pray for your children. In the workplace, pray for your customers. Pray for your fellow workers. And as we, we're, we're priests to bring God to people and to intercede with them before God, to take them to the throne of, of God's grace. And so interceding is one of the best ways we can love and serve our neighbors as we carry out our royal priesthood. And again, a priest is someone who performs sacrifices. Uh, and sacrifice happens in vocation, as we've said. We love and serve our neighbor. We're, we're doing a priestly sacrifice for them. Bearing the cross... in your bodies as a living sacrifice. But there are also sacrifices of, of thanksgiving. I know there were Old Testament sacrifices specifically devoted to that. But when you read the Psalms uh, and, and read New Testament about thanksgiving, I think one of the th things we can do in our priesthood is to be grateful for our vocations, to be grateful for our neighbors that God has given us. 
to be thankful for our spouse, for our kids, for our job, for what we're doing, for, our, for your country, for your uh, communities. I think that's a kind of sacrifice of thanksgiving. Most sacrifices are unpleasant, I suppose. Thanksgiving, thanks, being grateful is a joyful thing, isn't it? Hebrews talks about the sacrifice of, of praise. He's praising God is kind of a priestly sacrifice. And I think we can praise him throughout the different things we do in our ordinary lives. Well, I'll close with, with this. Uh, Einar Billing, Swedish Lutheran theologian, said, in all our religious and ethical life, we are given to an incredible overestimation of the extraordinary at the expense of the ordinary. I mean, in, in our faith, we, we look for extraordinary things, miracles and spectacular big events and high experiences and feeling so wonderful. But we neglect the ordinary part of life. And really, it's the ordinary things of life where we spend almost all of our time. God's there too. God is in the time you spend with your family. God's in when you have to go to work. God's in when you're just messing around in your community and you're doing things with your friends. These are all the areas of our different callings and they're all areas of God's presence his grace to us his working is making us grow uh, closer to him uh, yeah uh, here's some uh, resources if you want to study this further uh, I'm not making all this up there's a very rich vein of Lutheran Theology that talks about vocation uh, uh, to give a few resources. Uh, boy, I, I've written three books on it. God at Work kind of lays it all out like I've done here. I wrote another one, my uh, daughter, uh, family vocation, focusing on issues in the callings of marriage, parenting, and childhood. My latest one, I was asked to write... Uh, looks at vocation in a bigger picture, looks at it in the context of, of history, the impact of this teaching, the Reformation, the issues of economics, uh, but also it was a way to uh, bring out some of the um, things I, I keep discovering as I study this incredible teaching. Uh, I just mentioned that. I have a few copies of those I brought let you have it for a bargain, the price of ten dollars. Um, so just see me if you if you'd like one. But um, now tomorrow I'll talk about vocation in a more personal way. I'll talk about my voc uh, different vocations. I was asked to do this, and I'll talk about um, my latest vocation, uh, retirement, and uh, and how that. Retirement has actually made me more conscious of vocation than I was when I was uh, uh, getting getting a salary. Uh, so look forward to that. God bless you at this rest of this conference. Okay. Once again, I didn't leave enough time for questions. Tomorrow, for sure. Uh, what I'll say is not going to take the whole time allotted. I'll have a good block of time for questions and discussions. So, yes.